our next presenter is from the Canadian Hurricane Center and he's been with us for the last couple of years now uh, he knows quite a bit about amateur radio because his ham radio call is ve one MBR uh, he's also involved in the Canadian version of the Skywarn program called CanWarn he's the warning preparedness meteorologist at the Canadian Hurricane Center I'll introduce Bob Robichaud, VE1 MBR. Bob? All right, uh, thank you very much, Rob, and uh, thank uh, all of you for being here uh, today. It's good to be back at the uh, Hurricane Center as Rob uh, Hurricane Conference. It's, uh, as Rob said, I've been to uh, a number of them now, and, uh, and most of the ones I've attended, I've, att I've attended this, con this uh, workshop as well. So. Uh, good to be back. Um, I'm just going to kind of piggyback on what uh, Dr. Nab was saying and, and, and uh, kind of segue into more of the meteorology uh, behind hurricanes. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, I'll just give you a brief overview of what we do at the Canadian Hurricane Center. Then I'll talk about tropical uh, cyclones, essentially uh, hurricanes and tropical storms, what they are, where they form, uh, when they form, that sort of thing. And from there, I'll talk a little bit about how these storms uh, behave when they uh, enter northern latitudes, because that's a little bit different than the pure hurricanes that we see uh, in, the, uh, in the southern latitudes. And then there's a lot of talk in the last year or so about uh, El Nino and what kind of impact that would have on hurricane season. So I'll just uh, give you a brief overview of, of how El Nino impacted last year's season and kind of give you a sneak preview of what's coming up uh, for the following season, at least uh, as far as El Nino goes. <clears throat> so when I go to uh, outside the country, when I, when I leave Canada, especially when I come down to the more southern latitudes, one of the, 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 the most common questions I get is, why does Canada have a hurricane center? Well, in fact, we have uh, got a number of damaging storms over the years. Um, you can go as far back as uh, the uh, 1775 storm that uh, uh, is ranked the, the eighth deadliest hurricane on record uh, based on uh, information from the Hurricane Center in Miami. We've had the Saxby Gale in 1869, which was a very damaging storm. Uh, all the way up to Hazel in 1954, which was a, a severe flooding uh, event that occurred in our uh, um, most highly populated uh, city in Canada, uh, up to uh, the more recent storms like a Category 2 Hurricane 1 that made landfall in 2003 in uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and the Igor um, in 2010, Arthur in 2014. But if that, this doesn't uh, get the message across, uh, this is um, essentially the tracks of all the tropical cyclones in the Atlantic dating back to as far back as we have records and that's 18, uh, uh, 1851 and in that yellow circle there is underneath all those tracks are uh, is uh, eastern Canada so clearly hurricanes are a threat in Canada uh, and that's why we have a hurricane center so we're located uh, on the east coast in the city of Halifax in Nova Scotia and um, we're not really there to kind of take over what the National Hurricane Center does. Uh, we're there to complement uh, the information that, that they have. Um, as uh, Dr. Nam mentioned earlier, they are the Regional um, Specialized Meteorological Center, or the RSMC, for the World Meteorological Organization. So they're responsible for the Atlantic Ocean and the Eastern Pacific. And we're not there to replace what they do. What we're there for is to provide some additional information, some more focused information uh, for Canadians when uh, these storms approach our, our waters or our land territory. And what we would do, we would issue a, um, we would issue a, uh, a, a bulletin or warnings uh, when a storm is approaching. This response zone is the, the, the lineation between when we would actually start issuing bulletins on a particular storm, when we expect the storm to cross that line within about a, a three-day period. So three days before the storm would cross that, uh, um, that thin red line, we would start issuing bulletins on it. 
So as I mentioned, we, uh, we work very closely with uh, Dr. Nav and his uh, team at the Hurricane Center. Uh, we send forecasters down to Miami uh, about two a year to get trained on tropical meteorology. The picture you see there at the top, uh, um, top of the screen is from the course from this year. It was a two-week course uh, on tropical meteorology. A couple of, four of our meteorologists were down uh, for that. Uh, now, we do monitor activity in the entire Atlantic Ocean, but we, as, as, we, as I said, we would only issue bulletins when a storm is entering our response zone. Um, over the last few years, we've had very, very close um, interaction with our emergency managers, and it was actually one of our local emergency managers um, that uh, laid the groundwork for me to get my amateur radio license. So we work very closely with our emergency management partners. Uh, and the media as well, and as Dr. Nam mentioned earlier, uh, just to, to kind of underline how we work closely together, the Hurricane Awareness Tour actually kicked off last year in Halifax, where the, uh, the Hercules uh, Hurricane Hunter and the G4, uh, the Hercules flies into the storm and the G4 flies around it and over top, they uh, kicked off the Hurricane Awareness Tour in Canada. So, a little bit about tropical cyclones. The image you see here is essentially a, a satellite picture of Patricia, the, uh, one of the strongest, if not, if not the strongest, hurricane on record from last year. So what are tropical cyclones? They're essentially a non-frontal, uh, low-pressure system over the tropical or subtropical ocean. And they're, um, they consist of an organized area of thunderstorm activity and there is a definite <coughs> closed center of circulation. You have to have that center of circulation to be classified as a tropical cyclone. Uh, now tropical cyclones are, are there to, to redistribute heat that's stored in the ocean up into the atmosphere. <clears throat> Over the course of the summer, the sun comes up, heats the ocean. That that creates an imbalance, so there's a, a tremendous amount of heat stored in the ocean. Nature, nature tries to counteract that imbalance, and it does so by the formation of tropical cyclones. And hurricane is a um, regionally specific name for tropical cyclone. In the Atlantic and Eastern Pacific, they're called hurricanes. In the Western Pacific, they're called typhoons, but they're all the same storm with respect to the structure. There's a couple of things that we need for these things to form. One is a pre-existing uh, disturbance containing uh, abundant convection or, or very bubbly air in the <coughs> lower levels of the atmosphere. Of course, the whole purpose of the hurricane is to dissipate heat that's stored in the ocean, so we need very warm water, usually about 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, a moist and unstable air mass, so warm in the lower levels and cold in the upper levels and low vertical wind shear. So that means that hurricanes don't like an environment where the winds are changing a lot as you go up in the atmosphere. So not changing with respect to speed or direction because these storms form in what we call towers, towering uh, cumulus clouds. So if there's a lot of wind shear, the storm actually gets sheared apart before it can really get going. So if there's a lot of wind shear, we tend to have fewer hurricanes. And that'll come up a little bit later. So you can see the, uh, the image on the bottom here um, showing the spiraling bands that flow towards the uh, center of the hurricane. There's a tremendous amount of air flowing uh, counterclockwise in towards the center. As that air is flowing into the center, it's, our, it's also rising. And as it's rising, it actually flows up the top of the hurricane. And uh, some of the air most of the air actually flows up towards uh, the outside of the hurricane, the top of the hurricane. Some of it actually comes down into the center of the hurricane. Whenever you have descending air, you tend to get warming because of compression, and that's why the eye of the hurricane, at least in the stronger storms, is clear right down to the ocean, because that air in the center of the storm is actually descending, and it's warming, and it's drying out as it's going down. So that's why we hurricanes have an eye. Now, there are different uh, classifications of tropical cyclones, uh, most of it based on wind speed. Um, when a kind of a disturbed area of weather or a clump of thunderstorms develops in the atmosphere, in the, uh, over the ocean, 
and there's no center of circulation. However, uh, and the winds are less than 23 miles per hour. It's classified as a tropical disturbance. Uh, if, that, if that system is allowed to intensify and the, uh, the winds reach between 23 and 39 miles per hour and we can detect a closed center of circulation, uh, then that storm is classified as a tropical depression and it gets a number and it gets a number and a lot closer scrutiny by the hurricane center as it's going wherever it's going. If that same storm is allowed to intensify even further and the winds reach uh, 40 to 73 miles per hour, that's when it gets a name and is classified as a tropical storm. And if it intensifies even further and the winds reach uh, 74 miles per hour, that's when it's classified as a hurricane and we have five categories of hurricane and category three, four, and five are what we consider major hurricanes. So the typical life cycle of these things, um, I mean, they could form in, in uh, anywhere in the tropical Atlantic and the Gulf of uh, Mexico. Uh, the typical scenario that we see is a disturbance to make it off the coast of Africa and then to intensify as it's heading across the Atlantic and then it becomes a tropical storm and a hurricane and often what they'll do, they'll start to recurve and then transform themselves into what looks more like a winter storm with respect to the structure. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about how storms behave in northern latitudes. So hurricane season starts June 1st, extends until the end of November, and uh, we really start to see things picking up in August into September because that's when the water temperature actually reaches its maximum towards the end of the summer into the early fall. So September is the peak month for hurricane season and September, right, right around September 10th statistically is the date that's had the highest number of tropical cyclones in the Atlantic Ocean. The hazards, uh, Dr. Nan mentioned them earlier, storm surge, that's the, the main killer. Uh, for tropical cyclones here in the U.S. Uh, also, of course, wind uh, is a major hazard with hurricanes, um, heavy rainfall, flash flooding, tornadoes, waves, and rip currents as well. So I mentioned that these storms behave a little bit differently when they start to come up into northern latitudes. So going back to this uh, image that I had earlier, so the storms when they start to move up, what we have out in the Atlantic Ocean is what we call the Bermuda High. And that circulates clockwise in the entire Atlantic. So sometimes it's strong, sometimes it's weak, but it, the, the tropical cyclones will usually circumnavigate this big uh, Bermuda High. And then once they start to come up in the northern latitudes, they start to change structure. And there's a couple of different things that can happen to, an, to these storms as they're coming up uh, towards northern latitudes. Uh, in the first case here, we have the jet stream that is dipping down, but not too far down, or well away from the center of the storm itself. Uh, and then in this case, the, the storm can make landfall here in Florida or keep going into the um, Gulf of Mexico. Another scenario is where the storm is tracking a little bit further north and just sticks very close to that Bermuda High. And in this particular uh, setup of the jet stream, all the east coast of the US into eastern Canada would typically be warm and humid, which is a good environment uh, to, for the hurricane to maintain some of its intensity. Now it's going over colder water at this time, so it will be weakening but it may weaken slower than it normally would based on this uh, weather pattern. Another pattern that we typically see is when the jet stream dips down a lot further south. This is a typical scenario of what you'd see in the late fall, kind of late September into October. And in this case, when the hurricane meets the jet stream, because of all that wind shear, because the jet stream is a, a river of very strong air in the upper levels of the atmosphere, the storm just gets ripped apart and weakens quite rapidly. But every now and then, we have a storm that approaches the, uh, the trough of the jet stream here, the tip of the, the bottom of the jet stream, and, and then starts to, what we like to say, gets picked up by the jet stream. 
And there may be some weakening at first, but then that's followed by some further strengthening. And we've seen a lot of examples of that over the years, and, and we're getting to be pretty good at forecasting what will happen when this particular uh, phenomenon occurs. And um, part of that is what happens uh, to the rainfall pattern. When we have a, uh, the, the process of the, the tropical system becoming a, a more like a winter type storm is called extra tropical transition. And the final uh, result is what we call a post tropical storm. It keeps that name. So if we have uh, um, tropical storm Rob or Hurricane Rob, if it transforms itself, it may become post tropical storm Rob. So it keeps its name even though it's no longer a pure hurricane. But what we know happens to the rainfall when it's a pure hurricane, we have heavy rain on both sides of the storm. When we're going through this transition, the rain shifts to the left hand side of the track, where often there may be no rain at all on the right hand side of the track. Uh, and quite often there may not be any cloud on the right hand side of the track. All the heavier rain, all the flooding rain will be on the left hand side of the track. And a good example of that uh, is um, Hurricane Irene from 2011. Caused extensive flooding in uh, Vermont. The storm actually came up through New York and pretty much followed the, uh, the border of uh, Maine and, um, not Maine, but uh, uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. And Vermont got all the, uh, the rain, and this is what uh, resulted from all that uh, flooding rainfall. Now, uh, the opposite thing happens to the wind. Because the storm is accelerating, it's picking up speed, uh, the wind speed on the right-hand side of the track does not diminish quite as much as it does on the left-hand side of the track. So, uh, so the end result is that you have all your damaging wind on the right-hand side of the track. Meanwhile, all your uh, rain is on the left-hand side of the track. So we, 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 can, we can distinguish between these two hazards a lot better when the, the storm goes through this uh, transition. Uh, an example of this is Sandy in 2012. Where you can see here is some of the just looking at some of the numbers. The wind is definitely stronger on the right hand side of the track, uh, and they got a lot more precipitation on the uh, on the left hand side of the track. Although you don't see the, the numbers for precipitation here, um, Sandy is one example. Irene would be another good example because as the storm was going up um, through Vermont and New Hampshire. Vermont was getting all the rain. Meanwhile, eastern parts of Massachusetts were getting hurricane force wind gusts, uh, while there was no damaging wind in Vermont at all. So a very clear distinction between the rainfall and the uh, wind during when these storms come up into northern latitudes. Another thing that only happens when the storm is accelerating is what happens to the waves. In a purely tropical weather system, it's in the tropics, the storm is moving quite slowly and it's generating waves. And the storm is moving so slowly that the waves move out ahead of the storm because the waves move faster than the storm. <clears throat> In the case of a winter storm, it's the opposite. The, um, the storm actually moves faster and kind of outstrips its own waves. So what you'll typically see is the waves crashing on shore uh, a little bit after the winter storm has gone by. So now think of a, a purely tropical storm. It's generating waves. The waves are moving out ahead of it. But now the storm is accelerating. So now all of a sudden you have this area within the storm where the waves that are being created are in harmony with the storm itself. And when that happens, that allows the waves to build and build and build and build and reach heights that we didn't even know were possible. And one example of that, of that is back in 1995, we had the QE2 luxury liner that was uh, on its way from Europe to uh, New York City. And as it was approaching, they knew there was a storm coming, but it was, it was somewhat weakening. The winds were still strong, but it was accelerating. So there was a part of the storm where the waves were were, were building to incredible heights. None of this was actually observed by any buoys out there um, but until the ship got close to where that area of large waves were. So in a very short distance, 
the, um, the, the, the ship encountered waves of, uh, of nine, nine meters and then 29 meters, which is 95 feet. So in no time at all, it went through something it could handle to 95 foot waves. And then for a, sh for a short period of time, it didn't last too long, thank, thank goodness. Uh, but it gives you an idea of how this uh, particular hazard uh, can be very dangerous uh, to, uh, to uh, folks who are out on the sea. And then if you look at the, the bottom graph down here, this is from a, another storm which occurred a couple of years ago, Gonzalo. This is from a buoy that's off the coast of uh, Newfoundland. And basically, I won't get into the numbers here, but you can see how fast the wave height actually rises. So think of someone that's going to the coast to see the waves, which a lot of people tend to do. They want to see the majestic waves crashing on shore. Um, and a lot of people don't know of this particular hazard where you can get into these large waves in a short period of time. So we've lost a lot of people all along the coast in, uh, in Canada, down into New England, because of this phenomenon that a lot of people don't know about. And this only happens in the northern latitudes because the storm is accelerating as it's going through the northern latitudes. So just finishing off, uh, just kind of talking a little bit about El Nino and its impact on uh, last year's hurricane season. First of all, what is El Nino? El Nino is essentially a warm patch of water, warmer than the average, uh, that's off the coast of, uh, of uh, South America, and it creates havoc on weather patterns all around the globe. Essentially what we, ha what we have in what we call a neutral uh, situation, where there's no El Nino, is we have the easterly trade winds blowing from east to west, and that pushes the some of the warmer water towards the west and what happens is what we call upwelling. So we have water that's in that part of the Pacific Ocean moving westward. That has to be replaced by deeper water that's colder and so we get cooler water in the eastern Pacific and warmer water in the uh, western Pacific. That's kind of a, what we call a neutral condition. In the case of an El Nino, those easterly trade winds actually uh, get a lot lighter and it cuts off this upwell. So there's no longer cooler water from the lower levels of uh, the ocean coming up to replace that warmer water. So that results in this huge patch of warm water off the coast of South America. Now the opposite of that is what we call La Nina. Now La Nina is a case where the easterly trade winds blow a little bit stronger and that increases the upwelling, causing uh, a lot colder water in that area of the Pacific compared to, uh, compared to average. So you might ask, well, how does water temperature in the Pacific have an impact on hurricanes in the Atlantic? Well, what happens is the, uh, the El Nino creates stronger uh, westerly winds in the tropics, and that causes more wind shear in the Atlantic Ocean profile here that you see the, uh, the, the red line shows wind speed and direction in the Atlantic Ocean uh, in the case of a La Nina. So as you're going up in the atmosphere, the winds stay about the same. So there's not a lot of wind shear when we have a La Nina situation. When we have an El Nino, we have slightly stronger um, uh, uh, easterly winds in the Atlantic, not in the Pacific, but in the Atlantic. But we also have that stronger winds in the uh, upper levels of the atmosphere as well. So much more wind shear in the Atlantic Ocean when we have a El Nino situation. And last year, at the end of hurricane season, this is what we saw. The red indicates water temperature that's warmer than average. So clearly, uh, you can see that that part of the Pacific Ocean that we look at for uh, El Nino showed that the uh, water temperature was uh, above average, so warmer than average. So clearly a, a strong El Nino, uh, one of the strongest ever on record as a matter of fact. So what impact did that have on the hurricane season? Well, we had 11 named storms. Uh, the average is 12, four hurricanes and the average is six. 
and the two major hurricanes, and the average is three. So um, clearly we were a bit um, on the low side with respect to average hurricanes, and you can see with the Atlantic, with the Pacific Ocean being warmer, um, the Pacific had clearly more storms than average. So what's going on right now? So this is the map that I, uh, um, I got from this morning showing the area of concern for uh, El Nino. And you can see that the water level, although the water temperature, although still warm, is not nearly as warm as it, is, as it was back in December. So what we're looking at is a cooling trend in the water in the Pacific, which is indicating that we're heading out of this El Nino, which is an inhibitor to hurricanes. If we look at what the water temperature might be uh, out there during hurricane season, uh, this is a um, ensemble forecast or a, a series of model runs showing the water temperature um, over the next few months. And uh, anything below this red line is essentially not an El Nino anymore. It's either a neutral or if it's below the blue line, it's actually in the op it's actually the opposite of El Nino and, uh, and it's a La Nina situation. The uh, yellow rectangle here is basically hurricane season. So most of the models that predict water temperature, that predict what the El Nino is going to be like during hurricane season, most of these models do not show any El Nino once hurricane season starts in, uh, in June. So we're either going to be in a neutral situation or a La Nina. But uh, the key thing here is that we'll, we won't be in, uh, uh, in an El Nino situation during this coming hurricane season, or at least probably not. So finally, regardless of the amount, uh, the number of storms that we get in the Atlantic uh, this season, um, uh, it's, I just want to reiterate what Dr. Nab said earlier, uh, the importance of getting your weather reports. Uh, he uh, uh, mentioned his example of how one report from an amateur radio operator uh, changed the historical uh, uh, documentation on a particular storm. We have a lot of example, examples uh, as well where a report from an amateur radio operator either um, generated some weather warnings or caused us to maintain weather warnings where we would have other, otherwise ended them. Uh, so I can't reiterate enough how important your reports are to the forecasters who are sitting on the desk. And I like uh, the way that Dr. Nav put it, that you guys are our eyes, you're our window to what's going on out there. So thank you for your reports and thank you for your time this afternoon. Yeah.